Welcome everyone uh, to the first uh, seminar in this uh, for this uh, term. This is, as you probably know, this uh, CSA in the seminar series for the Center of the Studies for African Economics. Um, my name is Lucas Hensel. I'm a postdoc at the center, and I'm one of the organizers of this uh, seminar series, jointly with um, Emma Riley and Margarita Klimmark and um, Simon Quinn and Julian Labon, uh, who are kind of supporting us in our roles uh, here. Before I introduce our speaker today, let me briefly set the ground rules. We'll start right now. And our speaker today uh, will speak for 45 minutes, um, during which we only allow clarifying questions. Um, if you want to ask any clarifying questions, you can do so using the Q&A function. And I might or might not decide to let you ask the question, depending on uh, how we are doing in time. Um, yeah. After the 45 minutes, we, there's 15 minutes of general Q&A, and you can uh, ask a question by using the raising hand functions in Zoom, and then we'll call upon uh, people who've asked questions. Hopefully, we'll get through with everyone. Um, yeah, so, so much for the logistics. So today, uh, we are very happy to have uh, Maria Petrova, I uh, here presenting to us. She's a research professor at the Universidad Pompeu Fabra and the Institute for Political Economy and Governance in Barcelona. Um, and she'll present on social networks and uh, xenophobia. Uh, thank you very much. And the floor is yours. So I'll stop sharing and then you should be able to share your screen. Okay, so it should be here now. Uh, thanks yes. for inviting me here, like even if virtually. Um, so let's join the work with my fantastic authors, Leo Bustin, uh, Georgi Yegorov, and Ruben Nikolopov. And yes, I'm sorry to say that I'm the person who thought of presenting uh, a paper on Russia at the Center for the Study of African Economics. Uh, so, but I think that these issues could be relevant to many developing countries. Well, the motivation for my study comes from like the fact that, well, uh, in recent years, uh, both hate and xenophobia and hate crime were on the rise. Uh, we know that hate crime has been increasing, uh, that populists are on the rise, and also more recently coronavirus could also, and seems to also trigger some of xenophobia. What we do, we are going to look at potential role of social media in this process which is the role of the, the rise of social media is another global phenomenon which happened at the same time. And we will try to understand uh, political opinions and the decisions to express these opinions uh, more generally. So what we do? Uh, we are going to look at the impact of social media penetration in Russia on hate crime and xenophobic attitudes. To differentiate between potential mechanisms, we also conducted a survey experiment. And finally, to make sense of the finding, we looked at the finding, we realized that we really need to have a theoretical model and I hope that I'll be able to show at least a couple of slides on that. Uh, so, uh, how can social media affect hate crime? The easiest thing, it would be through coordination of offline activities. So, for example, we know that social media can reduce the cost of coordination in political protests. And this could be even more relevant 
for such activities as hate crimes, which are typically stigmatized. For example, if I want to find some like-minded people to, I don't know, beat somebody, it's, uh, I can't just bump into a random person and ask, hey, let's beat somebody. It's probably, be, this question will be stigmatized. So, uh, social media can also have a direct effect on people's opinions. People who were previously tolerant, they can become intolerant. While people who were like xenophobic to begin with, they can like, face the phenomenon of echo chambers. In the sense that if they only see xenophobes around them, they uh, now they are convinced that this is the right point of view. And social media can also reduce stigma of committing the hate crimes. And after looking at the data, what we find, we find that our evidence is consistent with the first one, with coordination story. It's also consistent with persuasion story, but we find no evidence whatsoever of reduction in stigma. There could be a reason why we did not find a reduction in, in stigma in our city, but this is what we managed to do. So how our paper is going to contribute to the literature? Uh, in the recent years, there's been a surge of studies on social media and polarization, protests, and even hate crime. And what we think our paper, how we think our paper contributes to this literature is first that we study long-term effect of social media penetration on hate crime and xenophobia in the sense that we don't look at day-to-day -day variation in uh, the impact of social media availability. Second, uh, we conduct survey experiment to differentiate a little bit between uh, persuasion and stigma. And we also have a theoretical model to explain everything together, consistent with actually some growth of polarization. So we also contribute to the literature on traditional media and polarization, do generally literature on diffusion of political ideas and to the studies of social image. Okay, so what we are going to do? First, we will look like I will be more precise in terms of how we approach this from identification point of view. But our first goal is to show if social media actually increases hate crime. And on top of that, if this effect depends on pre-existing nationalism, as the literature suggests that predispositions really matter. Second, uh, we would like to understand the mechanisms and we'll present the model. Um, okay, just to give you some idea how we are going to estimate this. Uh, we use the fact that Russia is one of five countries in the world in which Facebook is not dominant. Uh, its most popular uh, social network is called VK, and it was created in 2006 as a clone of Facebook. So like uh, uh, Facebook was created by Zuckerberg, VK was created by Pavel Durov who was then an undergraduate in St. Petersburg State University. And you probably know some al alumni from this universities, like Leontiev, uh, Kantarovich, or Putin. Um, so initially, it was by invitation only through online student forum. Uh, but then it was quickly opened uh, to the rest of the population. 
And only one year and a half later, Facebook entered this market and offered Russian language interface. Still back in 2011, uh, VK was far much, much popular than Facebook. That's I think what you need to know here. Uh, so not surprisingly, the first users of VK were mostly students from St. Petersburg State University. And many of them, they just never returned to their home cities, but they still had friend, networks of friends and families. So this is how VK page look like. You can see it looks pretty similar to Facebook. That's the founder of VK. Uh, so what we use as a source of exogenous variation, we argue that the distribution of early users could have a very long effect. For example, through network externalities. For if in a given city, uh, we see a lot of, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, when Facebook entered the market, uh, there was already large VK community, then it would be difficult for VK to join this market, for Facebook to join this market, because like uh, everybody was already on VK. Why should everybody, anybody join Facebook? So, uh, and to create our instrument, we use information on the city of origin of students in St. Petersburg State University who studied together with the founder. And we control for the same students from the same universities studying several years before and several years later. And because we can control for older and younger cohort, we can argue that it helps us to capture some time invariant factors that theoretically can affect why students from all over Russia could come to St. Petersburg State University. Note that Russia is a large country, so St. Petersburg State University brings in uh, students from more than 400 cities out of 625 that we use. And we use a similar uh, source of variation in our forthcoming econometric paper. Okay, so now we also need data on hate crime and the data on hate crime comes from a NGO called SOVA who uh, collect this information mostly from police reports or traditional media, like local media. They try to re record information such as, as the type of the victim, number of perpetrators, and uh, they classify it separately as like ethnic hate crime and non-ethnic hate crime. And Finally, as a proxy for pre-existing nationalism, we use uh, local vote shares of uh, openly nationalistic party Rodina in 2003 parliamentary election, which was the last election before the creation of Wiki. And we have a, a table which is not in the presentation. We looked at party manifesto project and uh, uh, in the, we find that this was the only party which essentially was nationalistic in that election and actually in several other elections. Uh, okay, so this is like, I told you Russia is a large country, but this large white spots are not because like, it's just nobody lives there because it's uh, too cold and too inhospitable. So, like, uh, um, so you can see here that uh, red circles are um, place different cities 
which have or do not have, uh, did not have any hate crimes. Uh, and uh, uh, we also colored differently places in which we conducted our survey. And as you can see that uh, I call we also happen to conduct our survey in places with and without heat crime. Uh, Maria, I think Simon has a clarifying question. Yes, please. Hi, Maria. Um, a question about the exogenous variation. I'm just wondering how we should think about the complier areas in this case. I guess, for example, a big city like Moscow is going to be sending students every year. So that's not really, the, they're in a sense not a complier here. Is that right? We should be kind of thinking about the effect in terms of more remote places. So uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, I should say we excluded Moscow and St. Petersburg. Like St. Petersburg because it was in St. Petersburg and Moscow precisely because a large chunk of uh, Moscow is outlier on every dimension. If we include it, it would uh, like uh, increase dramatically this, our significance of everything that we find, but it's because it's, it has a lot of wiki, it has a lot of hate crime, and it has a, a lot of, it had sent a lot of students to St. Petersburg State University. But if we look at all other places except uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg, then uh, if we'll, per year, we at maximum have 10 students per year from a city. So these are small numbers. So this, those range from zero to 10. So our variation come from the fact that, for example, uh, from one city, we have zero in one year, then one person in another year, zero again. And from another city, it could have a uh, negative fluctuation. For example, this year they sent three students, next year they sent two students, next year they sent four students again. So this is like this, the source of information that we are, looking, we are using. Great. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. Uh, many hate crimes are conducted in groups, so those are really perpetrators of some mm, what they classified as mild hate crime, probably beating somebody. So if we just look at OLS, what we find? Uh, first, we find that there seems to uh, be no effect of uh, no relationship between social media and hate crime uh, for places with low pre-existing nationalism. And we see positive relationship for places with high pre-existing nationalism. But that's just OLS, that's just regressing uh, VK penetration on the number of victims of hate crime. So like, uh, to go further, let me show you how our identification works. Here, uh, you can see how VK penetration is related to student cohorts, controlling for a bunch of stuff. Like distance to Moscow, be distance to St. Petersburg, and um, population, uh, age by education cohorts from census, just a lot of things. So what you can see here from this picture is that uh, the penetration of VK in 2011 seems to be strongly related to students who studied together with VK founder. And uh, it was not significantly related to either uh, students who studied one cohort older or one cohort younger than VK found. So it seems to be uh, something about this particular cohort in this particular university which was driving VK penetration. And we think that this story about like uh, the early users is the only reasonable explanation for this. Oh, sorry. 
Okay, so, and this is the first stage. You can see here in column one, the dependent variable is uh, just the number of users. Uh, we, we are taking a log from everything, so to allow for more flexible functional form. So here the dependent variable is VK penetration, depending on the number of students in various cohorts, and uh, a bunch of controls, including flexible polynomial of population and other stuff. And you can see that, um, again, this, the same cohort is important, other cohorts are not important. It's true that the share of pre-existing nationalism is correlated with VK penetration. At the same time, as we show in column two and three, this pre-existing nationalism was not really related to our source of variation, which was not related to any of the student cohorts that we use for identification. So uh, perhaps there are some other questions. I don't know. I think that uh, on identification, I think that here it could be a good moment to answer them. I'll give that to the attendees quickly. So far, I don't see any questions. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, so now I'm going, I will first show you a couple of uh, uh, tables with the reduced form, then I will show you IV and explain some of the concerns with the IV. Uh, here, we, what we essentially do, we regress the number of hate crime victims uh, on the size of different student cohorts and pre-existing nationalism. And what you can see here is that we don't have any strong evidence that uh, places with high social media penetration actually had because of that high number of victims of hate crime. And that probably makes sense because if you, like Russia is a large country and many places are very homogeneous and many people are still quite tolerant. Uh, so like, in order to have hate crime, probably you have, you need to have some sort of predisposition for that. Maybe social media cannot make like uh, tolerant people uh, run and commit hate crimes, but maybe they can change the, like on the margin opinion of those who, mm, uh, who uh, were already close to committing hate crimes. So this is uh, how this reduced form looks like if we uh, regress again uh, hate crime, the number of hate crime victims, and we have similar results for the number of, of hate crimes. So it doesn't really matter whether we use number of victims or number of crimes. So uh, here you can see that it seems to be the case that uh, for the same, uh, for uh, high VK penetration, which is here captured by the same student cohort, uh, student cohort studied with, uh, at St. Petersburg State University. We see uh, this positive effect of social media on hate crime in places with high pre-existing level of nationalism. Simon? I think Julia has uh, raised his hand first and then Simon yeah. maybe. Okay. Sure, whatever. Um, thanks. So I just have one very silly question is, so the unit of observation here is a municipality or a district, but you have data on hate crime for quite a large time period. Do you aggregate everything or do you use the the yearly variation as well in terms of the, your outcome variables? Uh, so, uh, 
the unit of observation is a city. We have all cities above uh, 20,000 people in our, like, uh, in our sample. But those are hate crimes conducted between 2007 and 2015. So that's the years for which we have data for. And uh, we actually, I, I'm not sure that I have this in the presentation. I, I think I have somewhere in the end. Um, we try to look at it separately by period. And we find that if anything, this effect is driven by earlier periods, like by 2007 to 2009 or 2010 to 2012, rather than 2013, 2015. So that would be consistent with coordination story that people just find some xenophobes. No, it could be consistent with many stories actually. So. Yeah, because it, it could be that like at the beginning of the at the beginning of the period, the kind of the original shock of having one more student in the university is probably quite important. But maybe as time goes by, your kind of your instrument becomes weaker in a sense. No, here we use instrument for 2011 because it's exactly midpoint between 2007 and 2015. But it is indeed true that the strength yeah. of our instrument is going down over time. So when we are going to talk about survey, yeah. so like uh, our, um, like, uh, so because we still use this 2011 penetration, uh, that could be a noisier measure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And perhaps a related question <clears throat> in some respects. I'm wondering of the 625, you're saying none of them sadly have zero victims. Um, and perhaps, re so it's not log of X, Y plus one, is it, if you see what I mean, um, on the left-hand side. Uh, okay, so I think that some of them have zero victims, but there are not that many of them. Right. Like, uh, so, and more, I mean, more generally, I'm just seeing the size of these coefficients, and I'm wondering if we should think of this as being essentially an extensive margin effect that it encourages the start of hate crime that wouldn't otherwise have existed, or whether we should think of this as a sort of more general expansion. Okay, so for the size of the coefficient, probably I need to show the next slide because like, yeah. So here, this IV version of this estimation. So like, because from the reduced form, you cannot infer the elasticity. Here you can take the elasticity and the elasticity essentially implies that like it, um, uh, if we increase, uh, like I think I have it on the, the slide, yes. <laughs> so like the effect of 10% increase in VK penetration, if like we have log log specification, so it's elasticity then uh, the effect is zero effect in places with minimum support of nationalistic party and approximately 25 percent uh, effect for places with maximum support of nationalistic party uh, and as i said i have the same results for the number of crime for the dummy for zero one actually i don't think that we ever tried so i think that we should yeah, so to split into between, better between extensive versus extensive margin. So Thanks. was there any other question in your <laughs> long- Sorry, no, that was it. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, here, one thing that I should mention here is that we are using, because our instrument are a little bit on the weaker side, especially in the survey part, but even here, so what we use, we use weak instrument robust confidence sets. And those confidence sets are accurate regardless of whether you, you have weak instruments or not. So, um, and with this, like another takeaway point from this table is that our effect for multiple perpetrators for total hate crime and for ethnic hate crime uh, uh, are two times larger than the effect for single perpetrator. 
and uh, like if we compare these coefficients in seemingly unrelated framework, at least in the reduced form, we can find that this difference is statistically significant. So like we interpret this as like a sign that at least part of what's going on is coming from coordination in the sense that like the effect for multiple perpetrators is stronger. But we still see some effect for single perpetrators. So that means that coordination probably is not the whole story. So, okay, so also just to like make sure that uh, like we had some data on hate crime for, from the same data source between 2004 and 2006 and conducted the placebo test. And uh, we show that essentially future VK penetration does not affect previous pre-existing hate crime. The coefficients are negative in practically all uh, columns and not statistically significant. So that's consistent with the idea that uh, we don't have any um, an observed heterogeneity that explains our result, that our instrument is good in a way. We can also try to look at uh, larger cities. And what we find is that our effects seem to be stronger, not weaker for larger cities. And that kind of helps with the problem that it could be some sort of selection in reporting. Because we think that like in larger cities, we in, prin in principle, it could be the case that uh, some of these hate crimes got underreported in the absence of VK. But in larger cities, the probability that these hate crimes would get unnoticed by traditional media is pretty small because traditional media, they need to report on something. So that's going on in uh, the city. Uh, while for smaller city, this underreporting is a little bit more of a concern. So, uh, so this table suggests that uh, we, the effect is coming, like is stronger for larger cities. So it's not consistent with selection and reporting. Okay, what we have so far, the average effect of social media is small, not significant, but uh, like, it is large and statistically significant for places with high levels of pre-existing nationalism. And on top of that, the effects are stronger for crimes with multiple perpetrators. So uh, the evidence for multiple perpetrators is consistent with coordination mechanism. But we also see some increase in hate crime even for single perpetrators. So we conducted a survey to differentiate between persuasion and social stigma stories. So what we do, uh, we ran our own representative survey and we included list experiment to elicit true preferences of people. And we also asked direct question to the control group. And our question that we ask is a question that uh, people ask uh, sociology, was developed by sociologists, Russian sociologists in other survey. And it says, do you feel annoyance or dislike towards some ethnicities? Without specifying which ethnicities those are, because in different cities, they have problem with different ethnicities. So uh, how we do list experiment, uh, we uh, ask, instead of asking whether you would agree with a particular question, uh, we ask people to tell us the number of statements a person agrees with. For example, I could be worried about increase in prices. I think that 
pensions should be increased, and also some some of the control group only gets non-sensitive statements. Treatment group gets the same statements plus a sensitive statement, which is I feel annoyance or dislike towards some ethnicities. So like. Uh, how we analyze this experiment at the individual level, we look at the number of statements individual agrees, depending on whether there was this extra option in whether this person was in treatment or control group. And we also interacted with VK penetration instrumented by this like student cohorts. And we also can run it at the city level. So what we find? So first of all, these are results without interactions, uh, without interaction with pre-existing nationalism. So what we find is that indeed in places with uh, more social media, we see a higher number of people who chooses high number of options in least experiment. Uh, in treatment group, which means that their elicited hostility to uh, other ethnicities was higher. And this, uh, like we have average effect, but this effect is mostly driven by males, the people with low education and people who are younger. So, so this effect seems to be driven by people who are more likely to commit hate crimes. So we can repeat the same exercise at the city level. Note that, note that here the number of observations is of course much smaller because we could not physically conduct a survey in every city in Russia. So, so we conducted it only in 124 cities. Uh, so, and we can plot it, uh, plot the uh, um, OLS version of this relationship here. Here we have inferred heat on the vertical axis and VK penetration on horizontal axis. And you can see that uh, at least in this version, doesn't seem to be driven by like, uh, some outliers. Okay, so if we start looking at the heterogeneity with respect to pre-existing nationalism, we actually see negative rather than positive effect. However, if we look at it in the IV format at the individual level, we can't really estimate weak instrument robust confidence sets. These confidence sets are entire grid. So we cannot make anything out of this state. So what we do instead, uh, like we first look at the reduced form and we also look at it at the city level. And at the city level, we see some confirmation that again, this interaction between VK penetration and pre-existing nationalism on inferred ethnic hostility would be negative for all respondents, for only males, low education, and uh, young. So, in sum, <laughs> what, like, I'm sure that I confused you a little bit, we were also confused. That's why we decided we, we need to uh, develop some sort of theory that can explain it all together. So what we find? We first find strong positive effect of social media on elicited hostility. And we also find this heterogeneity with respect to pre-existing nationalism, which is negative at the city level. So this positive direct effect is consistent with persuasion story, but for this negative interaction, we need to think a little bit. 
But before I show you a couple of slides um, on the model, let me tell you about stigma. What we also Maria, did, just yeah. to warn you, you have about five minutes left. Okay. Okay, good. Essentially, we tried to look at self-reported hostility, like what people like openly admit to say, and we did not find anything significant neither at the individual nor at the city level. So while stigma story would suggest that, uh, like reduction in stigma would suggest that those coefficients would be positive and significant. Thus we did not really find uh, any evidence in favor of stigma story. So, we wanted to have a theory that would predict that penetration of social media can lead to more hate crime, uh, to higher levels of xenophobia on average, but with different levels of heterogeneity that would have stronger effect of social media in cities on hate crime in cities with high pre-existent nationalism and the weaker effect of social media on xenophobia in cities with high pre-existent level nationalism. And at the same time, like uh, we should not have any significant effect on stigma. So, uh, because I have only five minutes left, I won't to go into details. I, I'll give you just some intuition of the model. So we have, uh, individuals whose position depends on their previous position and on the position of other individuals. So that's very simple belief formation model. Um, so, and we also have some sort of idiosyncratic shocks. And people's uh, position, next period position depends also on uh, the weight that they put on their own position in the previous period and also on the share of people who are like them. So, and we presume that the style parameter who are share of people that individuals perceive to be exactly like them is proxy for social media penetration, which is if I join social media, I have opportunity to find more people who have similar opinions. And all this literature on echo chambers, it suggests that yes, like uh, indeed you can find like-minded people in the internet, even if you could not find them in the real life. So, and uh, after doing this, we can, uh, look at the potential distribution of uh, opinions and what we find one thing that happened follows from our specification is that social media should increase polarization in this world but uh, what we also say is that people who commit hate crimes are actually at the tail of the distribution. While people who are just xenophobic, they could be close to the middle of the distribution. Um, so let me show you, yeah. So here you can see the effect. Uh, so if we have the increase in polarization, then you can see what's going on. That people at the tails, they are becoming more like, even more hating than they used to do before. So like we see this increase in the hate attitudes and high probability of conducting hate crime for people who are exactly at the right hand tail of the distribution. But for people in the middle, we see the opposite. We see that they are like even so like a, on average, the effect is still positive, like on average across the distribution. But for pe people in the middle, it seems to be negative. 
it's precisely because the density of the distribution becomes smaller. Uh, so, Kate uh, Kimes are luckily rare. So it's likely that uh, the threshold for Kate Kimes is very large. So it's likely to be at the tail of the distribution. While, uh, unfortunately, people who report xenophobia, uh, they are quite common. They're around 33% with direct question and 38 for elicited levels of xenophobia. So they are very well, they should be in this red uh, dotted, um, red shaded area. So for them, uh, like the effect of social media is probably becoming quicker. So, yeah, I hope that I'm on time. So what we think that we find uh, with this paper is that uh, social media actually can lead to increase in hate crimes and increase in xenophobia. But at the same time, this increase in hate, both of them depend on the level of pre-existing uh, uh, nationalism in the city. Moreover, we find that there is some evidence of persuasion of higher xenophobic attitudes for groups precisely more likely to be engaged in hate crimes, such as young, low educated, or males. And finally, uh, we see no evidence whatsoever of reduction in stigma. And theoretically, we find that this is consistent with uh, like a model of social media increasing polarization, but not making society more hateful. So, okay, I stop here and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Maria. So to everyone in the audience, you can ask questions by either using the raise hand button or if you don't have a microphone by typing your question in the Q&A. I already see a few. I'd start with Rosa. Um, thanks very much, Lucas. And thanks, Maria. This is really interesting. I wanted to start with like a very big picture question and talk about how this relates to your other paper, which is forthcoming Econometrica, which as I understand it, you found that this increase in social media also led to an increase in political protests by opposition groups. And so it is the big picture takeaway here that there's kind of two possible effects of social media. One is the kind of democratization of information, which can lead to polarization of people in the extremes. And then a second is a coordination mechanism, which you seem in both papers to find benefits the people in extremes because it's harder for them to find each other without social media. And now they can find each other and now they can kind of meet up and coordinate. And this might have like things that we might think are positive effects, but also maybe things which are quite negative effects. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. Like, I think that it's a, it's a takeaway point and from this both papers, and perhaps we should like make it more silent here that social media is a double-edged sword. So it can help things that we consider to be a good one, which is pro-democracy protests, but they can also increase uh, things that we consider to be like welfare detrimental, like hate crimes and generally dislike of other ethnicities and xenophobia. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, then next is Eric Cheney. You should be unmuted, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, Maria. Uh, thanks for that. So I have a question of whether you all have, have looked at ethnic diversity by these cities. That is, do you have data on this? And kind of if you have, what have you, what have you all found? I mean, I guess not so much for the identification, although you can come up with a story, it'll have to be time varying maybe. Uh, but I'm kind of curious, you know, how this correlates with, with hate crimes, uh, how it correlates with nationalism. 
And you could even think of interacting it, right? Just like you do with, with pre-existing nationalism. I'm not sure which way that would go from a theoretical standpoint, but I'm, but I'm curious if whether you have looked at this. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, hi, Eric, good to hear from you. Um, so we ha do have uh, ethno-linguistic fractionalization measure and uh, we find that it's uh, like, uh, I think that it's mildly positively related uh, to uh, like the hate crimes. I try to use it as an interaction with uh, uh, VK penetration and it was consistently very small and non-significant. But on the other hand, it could be the case that this like ethnic diverse, that maybe we should look at particular type of ethnicity. In Russia, uh, there are many, very many ethnic groups. I think it's more than 1,000. Even uh, only in one region of Russia, there are like, uh, they speak 160 different languages. <laughs> like in one region of Caucasus. So I think that these simple indices, they just uh, can't capture what we are actually interested in. So maybe we should use some index of polarization or something else rather than just index of diversity. And thanks for the suggestion. I will also look at whether we can interact uh, fractionalization with pre-existing nationalism. I think it's a good suggestion and I'll definitely try. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Julia has another question. Yeah. Thanks. So I actually, I just wanted to kind of pick up on some of the things Rosa have been saying. And so, you know, kind of bringing you two papers together. So I understand one way of thinking about him is like, you know, social media increase uh, protest and it increase hate crimes. But could we think of a world where actually it's not so much that those people find themselves online, is the protest is a way for those people, like, is the protest kind of the mechanism for the hate crime or is this something completely different? I'm wondering whether there's some further analysis you can try to kind of uh, run to tease out whether actually having this coordination mechanism about kind of, it's not necessarily so much about a crime, but just kind of people going around, joining the protests and through that later on engaging in a crime. And this is maybe where the, the timing of the data that you have might be allowed to, to help you. And maybe I might be contradicting myself from 20 minutes ago, but I just wanted to, to see what you had uh, in mind. Yeah, I think that you wanted to see this table. Uh, so this is yeah. disaggregation of the effect. So we don't, uh, like for protests, there were no protests before 2011. Like this was the first large scale protest since the end of Soviet Union. So the fact that we see some effect for 2007 to 2009 suggests that it's not about protests being intermediaries with, between social media and hate crime. So like uh, this effect happened before. So maybe heat crime could be intermediary for the effect of social media on protests. Uh, but I, I doubt it, but like, I have to think more about it, <laughs> about potential channels. Uh, yeah? yeah? I mean, it seems like it's likely because the protests came from the different end of the spectrum, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it could be the case that those people who, like, if you remember the picture from the model, so yeah. today I concentrated on the right hand tail and probably those people who uh, participated in political protests, they were on the left hand tail yeah. and they also could like uh, become more polarized. So we did not find any evidence consistent with political polarization for the like for the social media but there like it's a little bit complicated in a country like Russia because they have like a dominant party like uh, we have a president and the dominant party which supports the president which uh, takes a, a lot of like support uh, while like opposition gets like tiny parts of this support 
system. So this could be one of the reasons why we don't see the evidence of political polarization in that paper. But here we find that we can only explain everything together with a model which essentially produces political polarization as a byproduct. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Maria, for your presentation and for answering the questions. I don't see any further questions, so I think that's a good time to wrap up. Um, before we leave, uh, let me just remind everyone that we have uh, the next seminar coming up next week at the same time, 4 p.m. Uh, UK time. And uh, Claudia Ferras from the Vancouver School of Economics is going to present on political power, elite control, and long-run uh, development evidence from Brazil. So uh, we are, you are we would be very happy if you would join us again next week. And yeah, thank you again, Maria. And thank you everyone for joining today for the first seminar.